Good evening. Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name's Sam, um, and I've got the privilege to take us through the next section of John. We're slowly working through chapter after chapter, and we're up to the first 12 verses, 11 verses of chapter 8. Uh, now, before we read through that, um, let's just bow our heads and pray again. Heavenly Father, please let your spirit be at work um, in our hearts right now. Give us understanding of your word. Um, and help us to learn. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. John chapter 8. We'll just read through it first. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Now, if any of you have uh, flicked open a, a, your phone or your Bible, the first thing you might notice about this passage is that it's normally italicized um, and comes with a big asterisk at the end of it. And it also, in some older Bibles, might even be found in a few different spots. Sometimes it's chucked in around uh, Luke 20 and a couple of other spots. And this particular passage raises a question. Um, it's a question that comes up two points in the Bible here and at the very end of the Gospel of Mark. Um, and that question is, should this be a part of the Bible? Because if you look at the asterisks, asterisks in your Bible and see what it actually says, it says this passage wasn't actually found in the earliest manuscripts of John. Um, it was most likely something that was added 400 to 500 years later. Um, and what um, a lot of the, your notes might go into, or what a lot of theologians might go into, is this field called textual criticism, uh, which involves looking at thousands of manuscripts, trying to figure out what the original copy actually said when John wrote the Gospel of John. Now, I don't claim to be an expert at all in that topic. Um, I've only learnt what I've heard from a few podcasts and a few YouTube black holes, um, but in this particular text, we don't actually have any original copy of John's Gospel. The closest that they've got is um, possibly first century, but most likely second century, some fragments of the Gospel. Um, and it wasn't until a few centuries later that this story started to be included. Um, so most scholars have kind of settled on the conclusion this wasn't written by John at all. Um, but even if it wasn't written by John, there is also a common acceptance that it probably was a story that was handed down orally and possibly also written from the early generations of churches. Um, and it was most likely something that the apostles or one of the 12 apostles had seen and recorded for the early church. But if it wasn't something that John originally intended to put in the gospel, should we even be reading it tonight? Should we even be looking at it? Well, there's a couple of things that might help us um, to keep in mind when we look at this tonight. I think one good way to treat a passage like this is how it's treated in our Bibles. It's made quite clear that this wasn't part of the original manuscript. It shows a healthy uh, and robust way of approaching the Bible, of approaching Scripture, of seeing why it's there. It's not just blindly accepting what it's there, saying this is where it came from and we're not sure exactly of its origin. And I think that's healthy. But I think a second and very important question as well is, 
is there anything in this passage that is foundational, that changes what we know about God, that changes how we're meant to live as Christians? Or is it something that confirms what we see elsewhere in Scripture? And just briefly, some of the big themes that come through this passage, it shows God's compassion to social outcasts, which is confirmed multiple times throughout the Bible. It shows God giving mercy to people who are in sin. You see that all throughout the Bible too. It sees God condemning hypocritical religious leaders. That's a major theme throughout the Old Testament particularly. It shows sinful people submitting to God's authority. And it shows God commanding sinful people to stop sinning. And those are all things that you'll find elsewhere through the Bible. So regardless of its origin, it's not like it changes anything or makes some sort of foundational change to what we know about God and his character. There's actually a theory from uh, the, the North African church father, um, Augustine of Hippo. He thinks that this passage was actually written by John and then taken out because some of the early church members were using it as an excuse for adultery. They were misapplying it, misunderstanding it. Um, which, it means if it is possible to misunderstand it and misapply it, it obviously is something that we want to try and understand. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight, trying to wrap our heads around what Jesus is getting at in this passage. So I'll read the first few verses again. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? So consistent with what we've already seen with Jesus throughout the Gospel of John, he's got this group of people, crowds often following him, wanting to learn from him, wanting to hear him explain the Torah, explain the Jewish scriptures. And um, they're sitting there at the temple, um, the, the holy place, um, and that's where they're learning from Jesus. Then all of a sudden, we have this scene where the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, drag this woman in who's been caught in adultery. And I think our natural reaction now is to see this and think that's abuse, that's looking for shock value, um, looking for scandal and controversy. Um, bursting in on this scene where Jesus is just trying to teach the people and then trying to make chaos out of it, trying to create some scandal. Um, and they come up to Jesus and they say, Teacher, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. Um, so first thing that we can know is that this is probably a little bit of a setup because we know adultery wouldn't have happened in the temple. It would have had to have happened elsewhere, somewhere in the city most likely. They would have had to have found this woman and then dragged her to Jesus. And there's two things that are quite suspicious and quite obvious from this. First one is, someone must have caught her in the act. Someone, multiple of these people perhaps, may have been witnessing it, which raises the question of how innocent are they if they were sitting there watching this. Secondly, there's a big character missing from this. Um, running is a solo sport. Uh, cycling is a solo sport. Adultery isn't a solo sport. Um, it's a team sport, and the bloke is obviously missing. Now, what, the, what it seems to imply that the religious leaders are doing here is, it, it's quite crudely put, but I think our culture has the best phrase, I think, that there is for it. It's called slut-shaming, saying this woman has done this, but we're going to forget about what the man's done, um, overlooking the, the man's sin and instead condemning the woman. Um, and there's a question that we all need to ask ourselves from this. And that is, who am I in this story? It's often not a healthy question to ask when we're looking at the Bible, trying to force ourselves into it. But here, because we've got three types of sinners, there's a very good chance that we all quite resemble one of those people. Am I like the woman? Obviously guilty caught in sin, everyone knows about it, you know about it, and it's plain for all to see? Or am I like the man, equally guilty, done the same thing, but I think I've got away with it. I don't think God's going to find out, I don't think anyone's going to find out, 
and I can keep this hidden? Or am I like the religious leaders, finding faults, nitpicking, uh, shaming the woman, um, judging everyone else while overlooking my own flaws? And I know it can be quite tempting. I subconsciously fall into this as well to think of myself as, oh, maybe I'll be like Jesus in this situation. That can't be the case. None of us are like Jesus. We all wouldn't have reacted the same way as Jesus. None of us would have, as tempting as it is to think that we might have. Now, whichever one of those three sinful people we we most resemble, and likely we're going to resemble multiple of those at different times in our lives, um, we still need to be confronted with our sin and hear what Jesus has to say. And so what was Jesus going to say? Uh, What trap is he being forced into? Now, at this time, uh, Israel was a colony of Rome. Uh, They had a Roman governor, and they they, they were given a a large degree of autonomy, but Rome still had the ultimate authority um, over over their everyday governance. And one thing um, that that often came to, well, that could come to a head with, was when it came to capital offences. Because Rome's law ended up applying when it came to applying um, capital punishment, executing someone. Now, we, we might see a, we see a very obvious example of that a few chapters later when they want to crucify Jesus, but they need to go to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, before they're allowed to, to kill him. But in Roman's law, it's not a capital offence to commit adultery. Um, perhaps that's because there was, it was quite rampant amongst Roman officials and Roman leaders, but they didn't have um, that listed as a capital offence. But that's actually different to the Jewish law. Uh, In the Jewish law, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbour, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. I think we see a glimpse there of that hypocrisy from the leaders, that they're obviously ignoring the man in that situation. But what that shows is this uh, political dilemma that they're trying to force Jesus into. Is he going to say, um, yes, you should stone this woman um, and side um, with, with the law of Moses? Um, and what that could do, if he's, if he's going to side with Moses, it means the scribes and the Pharisees are going to have a legitimate reason to go to the Roman authorities and say, this guy Jesus, he's going and... Um, contravening Romans law, he's going and saying that we should murder these people, commit capital offence, well, um, you know, bump someone off because they've committed a crime. Um, when I know that Rome says you shouldn't do it, so can you can you please deal with him? And actually, ironically, ultimately, that is how they they get to Jesus, um, but not at this point yet. So on the one hand, if he if he supports that, if he supports the law in killing her, that's what he's going to face. Or alternatively. He could side with Rome and say, no, this isn't a capital offence, let it go. In which case, a lot of the crowd is teaching the Torah in front of a whole lot of Jewish people. They're going to be outraged. They're going to be, well, you actually believing what you're teaching? You actually apply this law? What gives you any authority if you're not applying it? So the Pharisees have been, been quite smart here in trying to trap Jesus and lock him into one of those alternatives. So what does Jesus do with this political entrapment? But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. So at first he doesn't seem to answer. He just starts writing in the sand. And there's quite a lot of speculation about what he's written. We're never, we're never told. Um, one popular theory is that, well, maybe he was writing uh, these, these scribes and Pharisees all their sins in the sand, so they showing that they were all, also culpable. Perhaps he was writing the rest of the, the Ten Commandments to show which of the ones that they've breached as well. Um, there's uh, a, one theory as well that maybe it's representative of the hand of God which appeared the Babylonians the night before the Persians invaded um, and writing out their condemnation. Um, Also, it could be writing in the dust to show all of you humans are dust, you came from dust. 
Um, but whatever it is, I think it's probably more likely pointing out the, um, the, the religious leader's sin because that's what confronts them. And that's what Jesus points to when he talks to them. He says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And when they hear that, that's what confronts them. That's what makes them start leaving one by one. And Jesus shows incredible wisdom here. He works into the consciences, the conscience of the scribes and the Pharisees um, because he knows the law just as well as them, or if not better. And he knows that they know in Deuteronomy chapter 17. It says that the person who brings the charge, who brings the charge against someone else, has to be the person that casts the first stone. So if you're accusing someone of some sort of offence, you're the first person, if it's a stoning offence, to throw the stone. Um, And what you're doing by casting that first stone is testifying that this is a fact, that I know 100% sure that this happened. Because in Deuteronomy 19, it says if that's later disproven, if you get a witness that contradicts you, um, and if it's shown that you're actually lying, you face that same punishment. You're going to get stoned yourself. The, the person who's been stoned, their family, is allowed to come and stone you. And the theory behind that is that it's going to be reducing false charges and claims. Because if you're throwing out accusations that you can't prove, um, or might be disproven, you're not going to be doing it um, as much. You're going to do it only when you're sure that it's true. So these scribes and Pharisees, they, they know their own sin. They realise their history of hypocrisy in the past, but also what's probably very much sin right now in their lives by either watching the woman um, and the man in the act of adultery or refusing to bring the man and only bring the woman to Jesus. They're confronted with their own sin. And because of that, they all start leaving. We're not told why exactly it's the older ones that start leaving first. Maybe they're because they're older, they've got more sin in their lives and they're more confronted. We don't know. But there's one person in this scene who actually could cast a stone, who was allowed to, who is without sin. So all these people leave except Jesus. And this is Jesus, the the Son of God, the God from all eternity who's holy, who can't tolerate sin, um, who has publicly declared righteous judgment coming. Um, And they're at the temple where God's presence dwells with his people Israel. And that's a holy place. There's lots of times, or a particular time even in the Old Testament where People, um, or where priests were offering unholy fire and judgment comes because they're not treating it as a holy place. So here we've got God himself in the flesh and this sinful woman and Jesus gets to decide her fate. He alone has the right to pick up the stone and cast it at her. But what do we see he does? Only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. Jesus asked her, where's your condemners? Where are they? And they've all gone. She says, no one, no one's left, sir. Now the word for sir there is often translated, um, the Greek word is often translated as the word Lord at other points in the New Testament. Um, And it's possible that that's an indication of her conversion, of her acknowledging Jesus as Lord um, and her submitting to him, um, the beginning of her salvation. Um, If it is, it's the the shortest profession of belief in the Bible. But Jesus hears that from her and he says to her, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And I think there's a bit of a heaviness that we feel to that because of our own sinfulness. If we haven't been caught in the same sort of sin or or any sin, um, or if we're not a victim of such sinfulness, some of us might be plotting and planning some sort of sin as well. And we see here how Jesus treats guilty sinners. So that's the account of Jesus' very surprising interaction with this woman. So we're going to look at five things that we can learn 
from that account. Firstly, judge yourself before you judge anyone else. These religious leaders showed up and they wanted to judge. But Jesus says, if we're judging anyone, you're up first. Look at the, remove the plank from your own eye before removing the speck from your brother's eye, is what he says in Matthew. And how many of us can really say that we're pure, that we're, we're free from sin? Because Jesus also in Matthew talks about adultery not just being physical, but also adultery of the heart and adultery of the eyes. If you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. If anybody claims that they've got a faultless mind and that they've never sinned, they're lying. Secondly, put your rock down. If you've got a rock that you want to throw at someone, you might have some information, some resource or some ability that you could destroy someone's reputation, ruin their life. Um, And we might be tempted to use it. We might have it as a way to use as leverage against someone. Um, and it might even be something that, that's a just cause. Someone's wronged us in the past, and this is how we can, we can make things even again. But Jesus is the one who gets to deal with them. He's the only one who gets to cast the stone, to judge. Jesus is going to deal with everybody in the end. And so we need to focus on dealing with Jesus for ourselves and let Jesus deal with people who have wronged us like that. When it's all said and done, at the end of time, when we're, um, we'll be standing in front of Jesus, Satan, the accusers, everyone that's brought charges against us, they're gone. It's just going to be us and Jesus. So pay attention to that relationship with Jesus and get to know him as Lord. Third, God decides what's sinful, not us. I think today our culture would probably might hear that story of the adulterous woman and say, well, there was two consenting adults, but she didn't do anything wrong. There's nothing to apologize for. Um, One way that that, I've seen that play out recently was at the end of last year, our cricket captain, Tim Payne, got caught up in a sexting scandal, cheating on his wife. Um, And that compared quite strongly, I think, to three years earlier when our previous captain, Steve Smith and Dave Warner, got busted cheating by rubbing sandpaper on a cricket ball. Um, One of them was cheating in a game. One of them was cheating on his wife. Now, I gauge um, Australian public morality by Facebook comments. And the Facebook comments around um, Tim Payne were essentially saying it's a private matter, which is true, an issue for him and his family to sort out, and I think that's true. But they're also saying, implying he hasn't done anything wrong here. That's an issue that he can sort out privately and we don't want to hear about it. No worries. Whereas when it came to Steve Smith and Dave Warner, people were calling for life bans, that they should never represent Australia again. They can never be a part of Cricket Australia ever again. They ultimately got one-year bans and shows, I think, a little bit where our public morality is lying. We don't think of adultery as a problem anymore. Um, And here we can see that Jesus is calling it a sin because he tells this woman, go and sin no more. So obviously she was sinning. And Jesus is calling her to a countercultural lifestyle, Um, not, not 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 a lifestyle that's informed by society and by culture, but one that's informed by God. Because we, we can be tempted to let our morality come from those around us, from, from culture, and not from God himself. We think of it as, a, as well, what we should be looking for is kingdom down, not culture up. Kingdom down morality is when there's a relationship, there's clear conscience, there's the ability to go and sin no more, like what Jesus commands this woman. But culture up, culture up morality is relativistic. It, it differs on person to person from place to place. It's hopeless and it's empty and it can change. So God decides what's sinful and not us. Fourth, Jesus does not punish you because he was punished for you. This woman, she should have, by following Moses' law, experienced the death penalty. She doesn't because instead Jesus went to the cross and he experienced the penalty for her. He faced that death penalty instead of her. 
There's no one like Jesus who loves and seeks and saves sinful people. Jesus died for her, he died for you, and he died for me. And he forgives sinners. And then what we see from this woman as well is that she doesn't work from her forgiveness. She doesn't work for her forgiveness. She's then commanded to work from her forgiveness. What that means is Jesus doesn't say to this woman, go and work on these things, um, you know, try and be a better person, try to be faithful to your husband, tick these boxes, and then I'll save you. No, he says, I forgive you. Now go and sin no more. He's, commanding, he's telling her that we don't work for our forgiveness. We work from our forgiveness. Um, and that might be a hard thing for a lot of us to accept. We might have feelings of, of guilt, of shame, of weakness, and that might dominate our lives. We think of sin in our lives and we can't accept that Jesus has forgiven us. Um, but that can't be the case. And I'm sorry, but this is how my mind thinks of it. But think about God as the High Court of Australia and we're all local courts. And we're trying to, we, we might think, we might be living in guilt and not accepting our forgiveness and struggling to accept it. But in the end, who cares? The highest court in Australia, God himself, has declared us forgiven, has declared us innocent. And if he's done that, who cares what we think, what our feelings are? Because we can't change that outcome. God's the one who forgives, not you. So know that you're forgiven. Fifth, Jesus lifts condemnation. Jesus says to this woman, neither do I condemn you. She could have just been forgiven and then Jesus moved on. But she could have continued carrying that condemnation and shame forever. But Romans 8 verse 1 says, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So Jesus not only forgives us, he removes our condemnation. If we're feeling condemned, that's the accuser, that's rock throwers. Jesus has taken away our condemnation. And this Jesus is the same God who, a thousand years before this, had inspired the psalmist to write the following words, which I think um, exactly describe Jesus' actions and attitude. This is Psalm 103. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. This is the same God in the Old Testament who's compassionate and gracious, who doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, um, and who has compassion on his children. So let's all live in response to his forgiveness and that removal of our condemnation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus came and that he's taken the, the penalty for us, that he's died for us. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us live in that forgiveness, knowing that there's no condemnation for us. We thank you for your grace, for your compassion, and for your love. And Lord, help us to, to go and to sin no more, as you commanded this woman. Uh, Lord, please be letting your spirit guide us and help us to live like that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.